Well, good morning. Glad you could be with us this morning. And uh, we're going to get started and worship the Lord. But why don't we just open in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you that, Lord, we can gather together as family. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you are in our midst. And so, Lord, as we uh, worship you this morning, as we read your word, Lord, may you be glorified and may you be honored. And, Lord, in all that we do, and Lord, we just ask that you would be with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, let's worship the Lord together. Well, good morning. A little chilly this morning, so it means we all should be able to stand up and clap our hands and do whatever we can to keep ourselves warm. Tis the season, amen. Jesus, thanks for your goodness. There's a space in every beating heart, there's a longing that reaches past the stars, there's an answer to every question mark, there's a name, there's a hope flowing through these veins, there's a voice that echoes through the pain, there's a Love has a name, love has a name, 
nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love, your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. Your love, thank you for his love this morning. Sing a new song to the Lord this morning. Sing out in your words and tell him that you love him this morning, church. Jesus, we love you. lost I was in chains the world had a hold of me my heart was a stone I was covered in shame when he came for me I couldn't run couldn't run from his presence I couldn't run God. 
Lord, thank you that you are for us and not against us, oh God. We bless you, oh God. We sing you a new song. We worship you in spirit and in truth, oh God. You are the Almighty One. Thank you for your never-ending love, oh God. Thank you, Lord, that you love us without regard for where we're at. Lord, thank you that you call us close. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. Sarah. 
Father, we thank you today. Lord, we thank you that, Lord, you are who you are. And, Lord, we worship you this morning, oh God. Worship you this morning. Lord, we thank you that we can be in this place. And, Lord, we think of those who aren't able to be with us, Lord. We ask that you would just encourage them today. Lord, for those that are going to be watching service online this morning, I pray that you would just strengthen them. And Lord, that the word of God would, would be rooted deep in their hearts today. And Lord, we thank you that, Lord, we haven't seen an outbreak in Sioux Lookout. We thank you, Lord God, for your hand of protection in this community. And Lord, we just ask that that would continue. Lord, we thank you for those who have served our community during this time. And, and Lord, we thank you for them today. We just ask that you would strengthen them and bless them, Lord, for their, their servant heart to this community. Whether it's at the hospital or the grocery store or the first responders, Lord, wherever, wherever they've been serving, Lord, our community during all of this, Lord, we ask that you would bless them today. That, Lord, your love would be shown upon them. That, Lord, they would encounter you. Father, we think of the other churches and the, and the other faith communities in our, in our area, Lord. We just ask that you would strengthen, Lord, your people today. You strengthen your people today. And Lord, as we look into your word, that you would speak to our hearts today. You stir us to show the love of Christ. Lord, we thank you and we give you honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The last uh, couple of weeks we've been sharing uh, on faith and hope, and so today I thought we would share on the word uh, love, and uh, it's great to have Pastor Bob and Pastor Margie with us. Uh, we, have, we have missed having you here, uh, so it's good to have you with us today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of love, and, and you know, when, when you hear the word love, lots of things come to mind. Maybe your spouse, maybe your family member, maybe your kids, maybe your mom or dad, maybe, maybe when you think of love, you think of Jesus, hopefully. Um, but today I want to talk a little bit and, and, and share some thoughts about love uh, that maybe you haven't thought about. So, 
Uh, first off, you know, 1 Corinthians uh, 13, this whole chapter talks about love, and I'm just going to read it, and as I read it, um, just listen carefully. If I speak in the tongue of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I've gained nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not uh, dishonoring others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. <clears throat> it always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but, with complete, when, but when completeness comes, what is in part will disappear. When I was a child, I, taught like a chi- I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I re- reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put, on the, ways of chi- I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in the mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. This passage, when we read it, um, a lot of times it gets read at weddings. It's, it's, you know, it's that... Ver, that, that chapter that gets read at most weddings or a lot of weddings because it talks about love and hey, what greater time to talk about love than at a wedding? At least we hope, right? Um, but love is, is this thing that, that you know, um, is very hard to describe. When you say, well, I, I love that, you know, how many, how many have ever said, oh, I just love ice cream? Do you really love it? Like, do you really, really love ice cream? Because it's not, it's, it's not the same, though. It, I mean, I, I, I'm with you. Like, I love chicken wings. I know. They're not good for you, but hey, I love them anyways. This word love is, is something that is, is, you know, out there. It's, it's part of, of our culture. We use it all the time, and, and not always in the right context or in the way it should be used. The word love, you know, has many different meanings in Scripture. And and I'm not going to get into all of those today. But I I just want you to think for a moment this passage um, in a little deeper way. And think about it in the way of our relationship with God. You see, The passage starts out, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. Talk is cheap. It's all pointless clatter. Chatter, right? It's all pointless chatter. It really is just noise if love isn't involved. It goes on to say... um, if I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move a mountain but do not have love, I'm nothing. Being wise with great faith without love is nothing. It's zilch. It's nada. It, means, it, it, it really has no weight. If, if you have all this knowledge but you don't speak it in love and don't actually use it in, in that aspect without love, it is Nothing. I've met a lot of smart people over the years. And they let me know they're smart. 
and they remind me how, how not smart I am. It usually happens when I have a conversation with Pastor Bob. I'm reminded just how little I know, especially when it comes to the scriptures. I, I'm thankful for my friend, you know? But, but really, if you could be the wisest person in the world. You could have great faith. You could move a mountain. But if you do not love, God says it's nothing. It goes on a little bit further. If I give all my possessions to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So this is what I wrote. Sacrifice is not good. It is not going to do it. There is no gain in it if love is missing. You know, sometimes we think, well, if I just do it the right thing, if I just do this, 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 and this, uh, God will love me. God already loved you. It had nothing to do with what you could do. And honestly, sometimes we, we have in our mindset, we live in a world that thinks, well, if I just do this, then they'll love me. Talk in faith without wisdom. Talk in faith and wisdom and sacrifice without love is pointless. It's pointless. If you consider our faith, it has to be wrapped up in love. Our faith for God has to be wrapped up in love. If it's not, we're missing the point. We're looking for an exit card out of, out of hell instead of having a relationship with the Father. God is not wanting to have an exit card given to you. He doesn't want to give you a, a get-out-of-jail-free card. He wants to actually have relationship with you. And it requires love. You see, God's the one that initiated this whole thing. He's the one. He's the one that initiated love. 1 John 4 and 8. And I, and I think this, this is an interesting verse because sometimes when we think about love, uh, we we'll go, oh yeah, God's love. But listen to what it says. It says, whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Now, that verse, just think about that. If God is love. Now, I'm going to do something that I might you know, regret later, but that's okay. The next verses, 4 through 7 of that passage in 1 Corinthians, it talks about what love is and what it isn't. Um, I, I, I said this back quite a while ago. Kirsten had shared this with me, and I shared this one time in, in preaching. I had said, take the word love and replace it with your, your name. Right? Love is patient. Am I patient? Uh, you know, Mark is patient. So... I thought a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay, so what I decided to do today was I'm going to read the passage, but then I'm going to replace the word love with God. Because He is love, right? So, so listen to what it says. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always preserves. Now look at what it... Let's, let's just put it with that context of God. He is patient. He's patient with you and with me. God is patient. Uh, this is a struggle for me sometimes. I, I can be very impatient. That's why Pastor Bob laughed when I said Mark is patient. <laughs> He's patient. He's kind. God is kind. He's not out to hurt you. He's kind. He does not envy. He has no one to envy. Think about that. God has no one to envy because nobody has what he has. He owns it all, including you. He does not boast. He has nothing to boast about, for he is great. 
Who can boast about themselves other than about him? For great is God. He is not proud. He, has no, he doesn't have to prove himself to anybody. Think about it. He spoke the entire universe into existence. What does he have to, to prove to anyone? He does not dishonor others. He's always looking to bring honor to you. He is never looking to dishonor you, to discredit you. He's never looking to, to, to shame you. God is always looking to bring honor to you, whether you like it or not. And sometimes, you know, we think that God's out to beat us or God is out to, to, to take us out. God is out to destroy us. The truth is he wants to bring honor to you because of himself. He is not self-seeking. Now, he is. He is, but he isn't. You see, for us to be self-seeking, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me, it's all about me. I, I want this, I want that, I want that. For God, he is self-seeking in the sense that he wants you. But it's not about him wanting you for just his pleasure. He wants you for your pleasure. Think about what he's done for you. He didn't go out and you know, die on a cross. Jesus didn't die on a cross because he thought it was a good thing for him. I, I'm pretty sure it wasn't the most comfortable thing to happen. You see, he wasn't self-seeking. He was seeking you. goes on. He's not easily angered. The word says that God is, is long-suffering. He is patient. It actually says that he is waiting for those. He is lo so long-suffering that he's waiting for those to come to him. He keeps no records of wrong. Do you know when you got saved and, and for, were forgiven, the record, the slate was wiped clean? He's not holding it there going, hey, look at what you did. That's what the devil does, right? The devil holds up what you've done and said, look, look at how evil you are. Look at how messed up you are. God looks at you and he says, you're forgiven. Says that your sins have been forgiven as far as the east is from the west, they've been forgotten. That's a, a pretty far distance. You know, in Canada, east to the west is, is a pretty far distance. Newfoundland to BC, pretty long ways. He keeps no records of wrong. He does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. He does not delight when we are living in, in sin, but rejoices in our freedom. He rejoices in the truth. He rejoices in who you are. He always protects. Always protects. He's always, he always trusts. He, he trusts you. Think about this. He trusted you enough to let His Holy Spirit come and dwell in you. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you because He wants to bring life to you. He always hopes. See, God knows the future. He knows the promises He's made to you. And he always preserves. Now, when I, when I thought about this and, and thought about what God was saying and, and, you know, the fact that God started this whole thing, I mean, think about it. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world. He loved us. He loved the world. Do you know that that, that person who, who is evil, who, who does things that are so contrary to God, God loves them. He still loves them. He desires them so much that he was willing to die for them. Not just for you. You might be okay. You know, you might be okay enough to die for. But that person who you think isn't worthy of dying for, he died for. And if you don't think you're worthy for him to die for you, he did. 
You see, he loved you. The God so loved the world that he gave his only, one and only son, that whoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they do not believe in the name of God's one and only son. You see, God loved you so much that he sent his son. He loved you that much. Romans 5.8 But God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You had done nothing right. You were sinners. We were all sinners when Christ died. He died for us before we were okay with him. Now think about what God is saying. Think about it. That he loved you that much. This is the kind of love that God has for you. It goes on in, in Ephesians 2, 4. But because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. He showed grace. His grace was was shown to you and to me. First John 3 1. See what great love the Father has lavished on us. I, I, I just love the way that, that verse starts. You know, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. When I think of lavish, I think of you know, you know, the extre- the extreme like pampering like god god loved you so much he he lavished his love on you that we should be called children of god and that it is what we are the reason the world does not know us is that it does not know him you know john was saying this love that god's lavished on you is so great it's so great 1 John 4, 7 through 12 says, Dear friends, let us love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is the love that we love God. But that this is, not, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loves us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made more complete in us. Or made complete in us. You see, what is, what is the love that we have for one another? You know, you all know the, the passage in Matthew 22. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment? They asked Jesus. He replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the laws and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It's interesting that, that Jesus sums up the entire law with this. Love God, love others. It's interesting because he doesn't talk about faith or hope here. He, he literally just says, hey, if you would love God and love others, guess what? You would be complete. Because all of the law lies on this. So how do we love God? How do we actually love God? How do we show our love towards the Father? How do we actually express our love to God? You know, some of us were frustrated when we couldn't sing and we were like, well, you know, I, I want to worship the Lord because that's, that's an expression of love, for sure. It's interesting, though, uh, some of the passages in Scripture, 1 John 5, 3. In fact, this is love for God, to keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. He, he actually says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If you, if you love God, you'll keep my commandments. That's, that's the, the, the stress of of, of loving God. 
It goes on, 1 John 2, 5, but if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in them. This is how we know we are in him. How do we know that we're in him? How do we know his love is complete in us? By obeying his commands. You know, I always think it's interesting how we we pick and choose which verses we want to live by. You know, it's like a buffet. Uh, I, I like that, but I don't necessarily like that. What do you mean I have to eat Brussels sprouts? I don't like Brussels sprouts. Add bacon. Bacon makes everything good. Uh, you know, I sometimes look at the scriptures and I don't quite get why God told them not to eat bacon. I was like, the greatest thing you made on the earth. I mean, it's, like, it's one of the best foods out there. I mean, it tastes so good. Like, why would you, why would you tell them not to eat it? Okay, I, I'm a little off track. Thanks. Appreciate it. It goes on in, in John 14, 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. We see this in Scripture over and over again. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you're going to obey me, keep my commandments. You know, it's interesting that the largest passage of Scripture, Psalms 119, is all about keeping God's commandments and His statures. The entire, chap- uh, the entire chapter of, of Psalm 119, all 150 some odd verses say, here is my word, follow it and obey. So if we're going to honestly show love towards God, we must be obedient to his word. Not just bits and pieces. There's a little more to loving God, and that's found in John chapter, 1 John 4, 20. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. Now, I want you to think about that. There are probably people that tick you off. That probably bug you to the point where you don't really like them that much. And they probably go to church with you. I always think it's interesting how, you know, we, it, it's easy. We, well, you know, they're out there in the world. I, I, it's hard, you know. I can, I can understand loving them because, you know, they're sinners. They don't know better. They, they don't understand. But why is it that we sometimes don't love our brothers and sisters in the body because they tick us off? They frustrate us. They, they say something that we don't like. It's interesting because we're all capable of it. I've been here now over three years. We're in our fourth year. And I'm sure in those three, three years, I've probably said something that's probably, you went home and went, who does he think he is? If I haven't, I promise you I will. And it might be before the service is over. You see, see, it's very easy for us to offend each other. But the Word says if we love God, we must not hate our brother or sister, or otherwise we are a liar. And I get it. You know what? Not everybody is easy to love. There are some people who are hard to love. They're just hard to love. It doesn't matter how much you try, they're difficult to love. I've met them. Most of them were in Bible college. I actually had one brother in Bible college tell me that I was a racist. Because he was black and I was white and I didn't like him. And, and he told me I was a racist. And the reason I was a racist is because he was black. I said, no, it wouldn't matter what color you are. I don't like you. <laughs> you know, like, 
you could be purple, it really wouldn't make a difference. You're a jerk. You know, and until you change, it's going to be hard for me to love you. You see, he made a judgment about me, and he didn't even know me. But if we're, gonna, if we're going to be people that love God, it requires us to be obedient to his word and to love others. If we're really, truly going to love God, then we need to love each other. We need to love each other. We need to be obedient to his word. If we say we love God and don't do those things, do we truly love him? We, we sometimes act as if this whole love thing is God's problem. Like, he's the one that's got to love, because we're hard to love. And, and he says, no, 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 you don't get it. You need to love your brother and sister. I know God loves them. But do you love them? You see, I, 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 a lot of times when I read that passage in 1 Corinthians at a wedding, I tell people, like, this is an action word. This isn't an emotion. You know, we, we act like love is, oh, it's, oh, she walked in the room, oh, the butterflies. Folks, that happens, okay, I get it. But truly, love is an action word. Anyone that's been married or is married understands that love is an action word. It requires commitment. It, it actually is challenging. And it's not that marriage brings challenges. Well, it does, but, 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 it, but it's not that. It's just the fact that when you start living with somebody day in and day out, there are things about them that you may not like, that you did not know before you married them. I'm sure she does. <laughs> and rightfully so. <laughs> you see, love requires action. It didn't say love is, is easy. It said it's patient. It didn't say love was, was, you know, a walk in the park. It takes perseverance. It takes energy. It takes effort. Now think about it, when we, we think about the love of God, the action that God in, in, ex, did express, the action he expressed was letting his son die on a cross for you and I. I mean, think about the action of love there. That's not like, oh, don't they look wonderful? Every time she walks in the room in that dress, oh, First time you wake up and you look over and your spouse is drooling. I'm sure the word love isn't the first thing you think. Or the first night you go to bed and they're snoring and keeping you awake. It's not the first thing. Like love is not the first thing you think of. It's probably like you want to kick them and say, shut up. Roll over. You're keeping me awake. You see, love requires an action. So when we, when we talk about loving God, it requires the action of obeying His Word. It requires the action of loving our brothers and sisters. It requires this action. Mr. Rogers. was on TV for years. They made a movie about him. Won't you be my neighbor? Trying to teach children to love their neighbors, to care for their neighbor. The Apostle Paul and James reflected on this idea of loving your neighbor. Paul said, for the entire law is fulfilled in the keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah. Love your neighbor as yourself. Think about that, folks. 
I don't want you to answer, but I, th- I want you to think about it. Have you loved your neighbor as yourself? Do you love your neighbor the way you love yourself? Or do they tick you off and drive you nuts? Do they keep you up because they're laughing too much? That's Bob's, Pastor Bob's neighbors. <laughs> or how about this one? If you really keep the royal law, James says, the royal law, I think it's funny because he uses this word, the royal law, found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. You know, Jesus said, love God, love others. Paul and James say, hey, love your neighbor as yourself. Showing kindness to the least, the last, the the lost, the lonely, the unloved. Extending God's grace in in various forms to the hurting or the, the hated or the heartbroken. You see, what is it that we're doing? Are we expressing love in how we act, or is it just lip service? So what does it mean to love? I'm going to give you seven opportunities for you to choose to love others with. These are, these are ways to show your love to others, to your neighbor, to, to the one that despitefully uses you, to the one that you hate or aren't supposed to. You're supposed to love. First, first one is this. Love others like you want to be loved. Matthew 7, 12. So in everything do to others what you would want them to do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. What did Jesus say? Love others for the, in these two commandments, all of the laws and the prophets are fulfilled. So if you, if you really, you know, want to show love to somebody, treat them the way you'd like to be treated. I always think it's amazing. We, we, we want to repay somebody for the way they treat us. We, you know, if, if they treat us badly, we want to just treat them badly again. And God says, no, no, no. If they treat you badly, love them. If they treat you badly, why don't you treat them the way you want to be treated? Even if they don't treat you that way. Would you do that? Is that easy? No. It's not easy not easy at all but if we would do it we would show love we generally think of ourselves first and and we we want to make ourselves feel loved and accepted and encouraged if we want to express love to somebody love them the way we want to be loved the other one is this we need to love with uh, with apathy empathy sorry not apathy, empathy. It's the other word. The other, the other one, yeah. Romans twelve fifteen. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. You know, when I read this passage, sometimes I think, you know, it's hard for us to mourn with those that are mourning. We just want them to get over it so we can be happy together. Sometimes people need to mourn. And we need to mourn with them. Sometimes we need to rejoice when they're rejoicing. You know, one of the challenges we face sometimes is that when we're going through a really hard time, uh, we don't share it with anybody because we don't want anybody to know we're going through a hard time because, hey, we are all perfect and why would we want anybody to know we're, having, we're struggling? <laughs> I'm good! And the truth is, is that a lot of times what happens is we go through something, we struggle through it, we get to the end of it, and there's no one there to rejoice with us because nobody knew we were going through it. Now that doesn't mean that every single time you have a little boo-boo, you, you know, oh, I'm so, like, oh, look at my finger, like, oh. But... But it does mean that there are times when when you're going through something, you need to be able to express it to somebody. So that when the time comes for you to be delivered and set free of that situation, 
That when you go to rejoice, there's somebody there to rejoice with you. Would you mourn with somebody? Would you rejoice with somebody? Would you show love with apathy? Empathy? I do. Tomorrow. Sometimes we need to weep with those that are sorrowful, sit with them when they're, they're going through it. Other times we need to rejoice and be happy with them. You know, I always, I'm always impressed with Christians because a lot of times this is how we're happy. Somebody gets blessed with something. Something happens and they get blessed. And instead of being happy for them, we're like, how come she got it and I didn't? Like, why... What do you mean they, they got something? Look, like, what? I wish I had that. You see, there is no love in that statement. That is envy. And love is not envy. Right? Love does not envy. And, and, and so, do we rejoice with those who are blessed? Do we pay attention to other people when they're talking about their lives? Or do we just want to tell them about ours? We all struggle with that, you know. I don't care who you are. I bet you when you're talking to somebody and they're sharing their life, you're thinking in your head, oh, I've got to tell them about this. And if you don't do that, praise God you are walking with Jesus. The other way to love somebody is to pray for them. See what it says? Pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion, staying alert and being per pers persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. You know what? You want to love somebody? Pray for them. And don't pray this kind of prayer. Uh, God, would you deal with them? That's not love. It is, God, would you bless them? God, would you, would you strengthen them? Would you help them through this? God, would... Pray blessing on someone. You want to love on somebody? Pray blessings over them. It can, you know, this idea of praying can include personal prayer. It can be an expression of prayer. Maybe it's writing them a card. Praying for them on the phone. Interceding on their behalf. You know what? Everyone needs love, but they also need prayer, so pray for them. You want to show your love? Pray for them. You know, Jesus prayed for you. The Holy Spirit prays for you. It says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. Are we willing to pray for those who need prayer? You see, the Father knows how to answer prayer. And He's not going to answer it the way you think He should. He'll answer it the way He thinks He should. And sometimes we don't pray because we don't want God to answer the prayer the way He would answer it. Sometimes we pray, well, God, would you just deal with them? I mean, look at how, look at how much of a jerk they are. God, I mean, like, do you see the way they're treating people? We need to spend time praying for others. We need to love by encouraging others. Hebrews 3.13 says, You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. We all need to become people that are encouragers. It should be a part of our economy of life. We should be doling out encouragement you know it should be like we open up our wallet instead of giving like twenty dollars it's it's encouragement now you can give twenty dollars if you want that might be an encouragement but it's that idea of expressing our love through encouragement encouragement proverbs 16 24 kind words are like honey sweet to the soul and healthy for the body I think that's a beautiful expression of encouragement. Like honey. 
like honey. Maybe you can find a new way to, to encourage somebody. Write them a card, make a phone call, send them an email, send them a text. Hey, drop something off to their house. Bless them. You see, we can encourage one another. The other one is we need to love others. We need to love uh, when others hate. We live in a world that's messed up. I mean, if you haven't listened to Pastor Bob's sermon, uh, The Gospel of Hate, you should. Um, but here's the thing. We live in a world that's hateful. They, they make it sound like, oh, we're, we're, we don't like hate. You know what? They're hateful. We're all hateful. It's interesting because this, this is what Proverbs 17, 17 says. A friend loves at all times. And a brother is born for the time of adversity. When I first read this, I thought a brother was born to bring adversity. I have four brothers. <laughs> the truth is, though, I, I really understand what it means when it says a brother is born for a time of adversity. My brothers, I know that any time I've gone through struggle in my life, you know, they're there. I don't know how many times as a teenager, after I got my license and had a car, uh, how many times my brothers came and found me on the side of the road because my car broke down. They were there. My one brother drove four hours one time to come and get me. In the middle of a winter day, I sat in a restaurant with 35 cents or 40 cents in my pocket, enough to buy a cup of coffee. I know that was a long time ago. But I sat and bought a cup of coffee, and it was a bottomless cup. And I sat for five hours drinking coffee in this restaurant overnight uh, because I had no more money in my pocket. And my brother showed up, and it was long before debit cards. It was long before, you know, everybody had a debit card and, and everybody had a debit machine. This was like you went into this place and all they took was cash or credit card. And I was a Bible college student who had no credit. I was in debt. <laughs> My brother showed up and bought me breakfast. And then he proceeded to get my car off the road. We towed it into the parking lot of this restaurant. And then he called a tow truck to get it towed home. And then he drove me home. You see, brothers are born for adversity. You know what, folks? We need to walk with each other in those times that are hard and struggle. A friend loves at all times, but a brother is born for a time of adversity. In a time of hate, we need to be people that love. I'm almost done. Love with words. What are the words that you speak? Ephesians 4, 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. This is a struggle for most of us because it's easy for us not to be encouraging. Um, it's easy for our words not to always be good and helpful. Well, maybe your words are okay, but I know for me, it's not always good. The words that come out of my mouth, they're not always good and helpful. Sometimes they're not encouraging at all. And so we need to be people that love with our words. We need to be people that, that speak life. And then lastly is this. Love when opportunity just ahead arises. When, love, when opportunities arise, will we love? And you may say, well, what does that mean? Here's the thing. Galatians 6.10, Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You see, opportunity arises for us all the time to love. You want to love? Write our missionaries a letter. You don't know where to send it? Call the office. We can get the address for you, or we can send it for you. 
our missionaries would love an encouraging letter from, from home. I'm going on holidays as of today for a few weeks. And tomorrow evening, I'm going to sit down with the Willis's two children who are in Canada. Mom and dad are back in Turkey. They're in Canada going to school. And I'm going to go and have dinner with them. I told Jason and Jardina, Janera, thank you. I, I told them that when they were here in the summer, I told them that if I could, I would get down to see the kids when I was in Toronto. They're away from mom and dad. Ethan, it's his first time away from home. Serena's been here for a year, but Ethan, this is his first time away from home. And so I just, I reached out to them and said, hey, I'm coming down that way. Can I take you out for dinner? They were like, you would do that? Yeah, I'd do that. You know what? We need to take the opportunities that arise. To take the opportunity to, to, to bless our missionaries. For that matter, the opportunity to bless those around us. We can show love to those around us. The opportunities arise every day. Maybe it's that person that lives next door or the person that lives on the street next to you or maybe it's the people on the street. There's always those places and times and opportunities to show love. And maybe it's just even here in the NLA family. Hannah, I'm glad you're with us. She's going to be spending the next year with us. There's somebody, if you want to show some love to her, show her some love. Sorry for embarrassing you. But we're glad you're here. If we have the opportunity, let us do good. So, will we be people of hope and faith, or faith and hope and love? Will we be those types of people who, who express our faith and our hope to others and, and our love to others? Will we walk out our faith with action? Will we live our lives with the hope of Christ at the forefront of it? And will we always be showing the love of God to others so that we might be called the women and men of God? Will we, will we actually be those people who God says, oh, there's my, there's my child. Oh, way to go, son. Way to go, daughter. Way to go. You, you're showing my love. Way to go. When somebody asks, why do you have the hope that you have? Are you, are you able to express the love of Christ? You see, if we're going to be the men and women of God that he's called us to be, we need to love him and love others. For now we only see a reflection in a mirror, but then we shall see face to face. I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three, three things remain. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. In a time like we are going through in the world, where we have been restricted, where we have been challenged with a virus that seems to be hard to control or not knowing how to control in a time when everyone is is looking in fear and worry and doubt what a great opportunity for the church to show hope and faith and love what an opportunity to love those who are really struggling with all of this maybe there's some people in the family who who aren't here. Maybe they're not here because of fear. Maybe they're not here because of work. Who knows? But whatever reason, there are people in our family that aren't with us. Take, take the time to look around and, and maybe you just pick up the phone and say, hey, I've missed you. I just want to check in and see how you're doing. 
Express the love of God. Express the love of God. Would you stand with me this morning as we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you today, Lord. Our faith is in you, not in ourselves, not in what we can do, not in who we are. Lord, our faith is in you. Lord, we believe what you said. We believe that you love us. We believe that the expression and the action of love that you ex express to us, oh God, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. Lord, that it is that faith in that action that brings us into that place to be called children of God. Lord, our hope is not in something that's ma imaginary or unreal. Our hope is in the promises of your word. Our hope is in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Our hope is in the fact that we believe what you said. But Lord, I pray that you would help us to express love. That Lord, when all of the prophecies and all of the tongues and all of the everything else ends and everything else has been made clear, Lord, may love still be in our lives. Lord, may we love you and obey your word and love one another. And Lord, may we love others. May we, may we walk out a way of expressing that love to others around us. And Lord, be the men and women of God you've called us to be, that this house called NLA would be a house of love. In a world where hate is expressed, May your love shine forth in the darkness. And may we be the people you've called us to be. We give you honor and praise today, Lord. We just ask that you would be with each and every person in this room, Lord. And for those that are watching, Lord, online, we pray that you give them uh, just your presence would be so real today in their homes. Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts as this week unfolds, that that expression of love would be expressed to those around us. Lord, may we love our neighbors. May we love those who despitefully use us. May we express your love in a world where it's not expressed very well. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.